All right, hello everyone. Um, well, whoever's here. Um, I thought what I would do today is to read about uh, Jan Smuts because uh, Smuts basically uh, designed the South African Constitution in 1910, and he left us with a, a legacy that basically defines the entire political world we live in. But he's very neglected and you never hear about him in schools. You don't have his you don't encounter his thought at university. You don't he's just somehow, despite the most enormous impact on any like I don't think any one person has more affected the shape of one country. There are very few people who've had quite as much of a sort of impact. Oh, lovely. You finished his biography. No, that's great. Um, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read an essay that I wrote recently, oh, well, not recently, about a year ago, where I had a look at several key institutions that he had a body in, he had a hand in designing, and his impact, uh, and how his philosophy tied into it, you know, the whole holism and evolution thing. Um, and then I thought afterwards we'd actually read a little passage from the end, like the conc the conclusion to the book that he wrote, Holism and Evolution. It's in like a couple of pages, this, and it sort of sums up where he's going with this. And it's, he um, it gives you quite a clear picture of how he thinks. Um, it, it, very sort of strange um, sort of combination of natural and esoteric and liberal and funny funny sort of things going on there um generally speaking he'd fall into the category of philosophers that are called vitalists so he generally believes that there's like a uniting force to all of nature and it all's going in one direction it's all trying to do one thing uh, one one thing or the other and the most influential living vitalist would at the moment be uh, Nick Land and I have an essay that sort of it's like which is like very esoteric and weird that I wrote um, shortly after after this one on Jan Smuts that I'll probably read out like tomorrow or something uh, it comes as a pair so it's it's uh, it's one called uh, Asher and Drudgery and one called um, uh, the river, and it's sort of like reflections on Deleuze and Guattari and um, and Nick Land and Zoroastrianism and how people have applied, uh, you know, the second law of thermodynamics to um, biological sciences and so on. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, so I mean, with, with all of that little introductory wank out of the way, I'm just going to read the one on, on Onion Smuts. Um, and actually, maybe I should just, share, maybe I should share my screen here so that you can actually follow along because they're like a couple of nice little pictures that, um, that I've got. So if I share screen, um, let's see, Chrome tab. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, here we go. So, uh, can everyone see? Now, I I don't know if you this little embedded video is going to be audible to you guys too, but um, uh, ba -bum -ba -bum. well, let's hope so because it's actually quite nice. It's something from a, a film called Network. I don't know if you've uh, I don't know if anyone's watched it. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, Hans David, why why they didn't address the race issue is a question I've hanging over him about. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it, like in his own words, he said he kicked the can down the road. So, you know, um Yeah, we'll see we'll see how that goes. So I'm just gonna look at this. I got like, I love this photo. The the vividness of the colour on that film is 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 quite something. Um ach, yeah. So I said one vast and ecumenical whole. Because it's it's a it's a quote from this thingy so actually let's see if i can play it and let's see if you can hear it just let me know in the chat if it's actually working um and just get that up if you can't hear it just say so and i'll give up because there are no there aren't a lot of options here yeah 
um, streaming suite. Come on. Come on, boyo. If it doesn't begin shortly, try resupplies. Oh, please don't do that to me. Okay, never mind. Technic it's not so. Jan Smuts bequeathed to the world a political and intellectual inheritance so vast and so deep that it simply cannot be overstated. His worldview has reached into every ruling institution, making him one of the most influential men of the 20th century. It is a totalizing and all-encompassing system, the promise of a universal peace, liberty, and welfare through total world government, the sublimation of all political and cultural difference in a global English language order governed by a European elect anointed with the vanity of higher insight to guide the whole of humanity into a future where there will be no fear, no poverty, no anxiety, no difference, no prejudice, no discomfort, no pollution, no disharmony of man and nature, and no resentment of the governing elite. His grand theory of holism has given us the modern field of ecology, the entire philosophical framework for both the modern and environmental movement, and the government system which responded to it. It has given us the concept of the holistic, the nation of South Africa, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the Balfour Declaration, and the United Nations, and as a result, the contemporary understanding of human rights and national self-determination. It is also shot through with terrible hypocrisy. So in this, uh, just one more try. One more try. Come on. There we go. I'd like to try to sell something to you. Well, hello, Mr. Beale. Please sit down. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Bill, and I won't have it. Is that clear? You think you've merely stopped a business deal? That is not the case. The Arabs have taken billions of dollars out of this country, and now they must put it back. It is ebb and flow, tidal gravity. It is ecological balance. You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There are no Russians. There are no Arabs. There are no third worlds. There is no West. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and demain, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion. Yes. Petrol dollars, electro dollars, multi dollars, rank marks, ring, rubles, pounds, and shacks. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things today. That is the atomic and subatomic and galactic structure of things today. And you have meddled with the primal forces of nature. And you will atone. Am I getting through to your speech? You get up on little 21 inch screen how about our end democracy there is no america there is no democracy there is only ibm and itt and at&t and dupont dow union carbide and exxon those are the nations of the what do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, 
statistical decision theories, Minimax solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beal. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beal. It has been since man crawled out of the slime. And our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world in which there's no war or famine, oppression or brutality. One thing and ecumenical holy for whom all men will work to serve a common profit in which all men will hold a share of stock all necessities provided all anxieties tranquilized all boredom amused And I have chosen you, Mr. Beale, to preach this adventure. Why me? Because your own television does me. 60 million people watch you every night of the week, Monday through Friday. I have seen the face of God. You just might be right, Mr. Beale. Yeah, so I thought that was interesting because the way that I see it, so that is from the film Network, which is from 1976, and it's one of the most extraordinary films I've, I've seen. But what's interesting about that is that it almost perfectly encapsulates the worldview of the World Economic Forum, whose governance, global governance ideology grew out of the United Nations. And... It's the United Nations that was, uh, which fl flowed out of Smuts's thing. And of course, this character, Ned Beatty, was right. The world we have created is one of guided corporate hegemony, no longer determined by the ruthless conflict of corporations and nations who now reinforce each other's monopolistic interests in hypermanagerial synergy. Poverty, long thought to be the default condition of humanity, has been driven to a marginal issue by the march of progress. International conflict is today an issue of the poor, underdeveloped margins. Every anointed elite agrees that all we need to do is benevolently guide the perfection of this vision by means of an enlightened technocracy, extending as much generous welfare as possible and eliminating intolerance by erasing every nation and every state and every religion. In Beatty's speech, Paddy Chayevsky, that's the guy who wrote the script, articulated the voice of the new global liberal elite most fittingly. The world which has been created is, in the eyes of the anointed, nothing short of a miracle, a bureaucrat's answer to the curse of a monkey's paw. But despite these appearances, the curse remains, and the miracle is only a debt borrowed against the suffering, or at least the frantic ameliorative labor, of unborn generations. The material progress we have enjoyed is not the result of utopian reform, but of technological advance. And we all know that new cracks have appeared in the edifice. In China, India, Russia, Britain, and America, the right and left have all in their own ways spat in the face of this enlightened order. The financial fraud of the Chinese empire threatens to wipe out generations of political and economic progress. Over there, that's a, a link to an analysis by Kyle Bass. Um, or else enslave the world to the payment of their false promises. That's a long, complicated argument for another day. Um, Europe has managed to twist the values it took up in the name of freedom and peace, to dream of an oppressive and omnipresent bureaucracy and an irredentist world empire. South Africa is descending into ethnic separatism and neo shakaist fantasies of genocidal reconquista. And above the sound of the cracking foundations can be heard the locking and loading of weapons so lethal and destructive that their impact can only be be imagined. So how did it all go so wrong? In the same way all things go wrong, hubris and hesitation. 
Story of Jan Smuts is that of a man whose life and philosophy evolved together in an inextricable conceptual continuity, springing back from compromises with his social environment to embed itself in the most powerful and influential institutions in the entire world, guiding the shape of the whole of humanity from beyond the grave, according to a spiritual idealism born of circumstance and naturalist romance. It is the result of a man who could not take the leap of faith towards heaven he imagined, but bequeathed instead a choreography for future generations to eternally fling themselves ineffectually towards heaven instead. We are bound to fall. Now, of course, before I go on here, I assume all of you are well aware of the input of the Frankfurt School and all of these other sort of things that have uh, sort of contributed towards globalization and the erasure of traditional um, identity groups and religions and so on. But... Um, that that's a whole other story, and I just thought that this was much neglected. So, um, and this is a quote from uh, Old Smutsy Kins, where he says, "The mountain is not something merely uh, is not merely something externally sublime. It has a great historic and spiritual meaning for us. It stands for us as the ladder of life. Nay, more, it is the great ladder of the soul, and in a curious way, the source of religion. From it came the law." From it came the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. We may truly say that the highest religion is the religion of the mountain. Lots of this nature worship stuff. Jan Smuts was born to a small farm in the Western Cape, amid the wine and wheat of Ribeck Ves, to a staunch Calvinist Cape Dutch family. He joined school at 12 and completed his education in just four years, attending what is now Stellenbosch University at the age of 16 graduating with first-class honours at the age of 21, winning a scholarship to study law at Cambridge and achieving a double first at 24. According to Lord Todd, in 500 years of the college's history of all its members past and present, three had been truly outstanding, John Milton, Charles Darwin and Jan Smuts. He studied philosophy by himself at the British Museum for a year and wrote his first treatise on the thought of Walt Whitman, and it is here that he formed most of his ideas that would later coalesce into holism and evolution, a vast synthesis of natural science, epistemology, ethics, and politics. He studied the evolution of Walt Whitman's personality as that of any other organism, and this developmental notion of all things in evolution towards a higher completeness formed half of the picture of his grand theory. All parts evolved into higher forms to synthesize into greater wholes, Mineral became living tissue, became sentient life, became human culture, became civilization, and eventually a holistic human society. This was the development of the human personality, which found its apogee in communion with nature. His philosophy was more comprehensive than a doff of the cap to romantic and naturalist poets like Goethe and Whitman. Smuts formed his systematic philosophy partially through correspondence with J.S. Haldane, Henri Bergson, um, Albert Einstein, and Niels Bohr and followed Leakey's work on the climate's effect on man, balancing Darwin's theory with Lamarckian elements. Much like Arthur Tansley, who was inspired by Freud, the influence of psychology and personality formed the basis of ecology from the very beginning, linking it and its twin, holism, up with human society and culture inextricably. One of the central features of Smuts's life was botany, he would read field guides before bed every night and spend as much as possible of his spare time wandering in the felt or hiking in the mountains, sometimes naked. He believed in the notion of a vital force of nature and believed that the spirit of nature had restorative and inspiring properties. Those in tune with the spirit of nature could tune into it and through communion and meditation with it achieve higher insight. An expert on savannah grasses, Smuts pioneered the first modern nature conservation policies and coordinated the very first botanical survey. By the time the Royal Botanical Society under Arthur Tansley and Thomas Chip had begun to present their probative surveys dominated by economic and agricultural interests, Smuts had already commissioned and overseen a comprehensive botanical survey of the natural flora of South Africa, directed at representing the living ecosystem rather than uh, the grounds of economic exploitation. His followers John Phillips and John William Bewes used his ecological ideas to develop racially guide graded divisions of labor for maintaining order and harmony in human economic organization, and tested those theories out in a sponsored land regeneration program aimed at combating soil erosion and efforts to maintain that, uh, manage the tsetse flies impact on colonial African society. 
Phillips came up with the notion of a biotic community to describe the hierarchical mechanism he saw in operation between the white masters, black natives, and the agricultural and natural vegetative ecosystem. The biological system reflected Smuts's gradualist political program of trusteeship, which saw the development of the communal native personality under white tutelage through increasingly independent communitarian self-determination over time towards an eventual holistic union. In his all-encompassing personal philosophy, which knit together spirituality, epistemology, morality, natural science, ethics, and political philosophy, Smuts argues that all of matter tends towards complexity, all complexity towards life, and all of life towards homogeneous, interconnected holism. All wholes are greater than the sum of their parts, and all wholes are destined to coalesce into greater wholes. So too with political life, which reaches its highest expression in world government, an argument emerging from the final remarks of holism and evolution, such that this Tower of Babel is seen as the culmination of all creation. The process of civilization has always been towards the League of Nations. Rather than pursuing success abroad after his degree, Smuts returned home and worked as a lawyer before turning his hand to journalism. He supported Cecil Rhodes and his ambitions for a united Africa, under colonial hegemony, of course, but turned his back on the man after he orchestrated the Jamison raid and left the Cape to serve in Pretoria, rising rapidly through the ranks of the Kruger administration. Demonstrating extraordinary aptitude for strategy and logistics, Smuts not only coordinated much of the war effort during the Second Boot War, but also diplomacy and propaganda. After the British ground down the conventional Boot forces, General Smuts and Boerta spearheaded a guerrilla campaign, beginning with no more than 500 men, and over a two-year campaign seized the land from the Hulafantsrafir to the Orange from a British occupation force 40 times their number. The British intensified their Scorched Earth campaign in response and exterminated tens of thousands of Boers and their African servants in concentration camps. This being too much to bear, Smuts and Boerta sued for peace, and Smuts drafted the surrender with Lord Kitchener at Vereniging at a town called... Uh, at Vereniging. And I just thought that that was, you know, considering his philosophy, quite a, a thing. Uh, while the Commission for South Africa was under... Uh, blah, 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 blah. While the Commission for South Africa was under Lord Milner, Smuts and all Afrikaners were political outsiders. But once the Conservatives in the British Parliament were replaced by the Liberals, Smuts sailed to England, and despite having no more standing than a lawyer who went to a good university, managed to persuade the British leadership to grant self-government to the Boer republics. Together with the political allies in Pretoria, he wrote the constitution for the Transvaal. He also played a central part in the Talbeweging, which birthed Afrikaans as a formalized language. In the following years, Smuts managed to secure the political position to unify South Africa and fiercely pushed for a unitary government, critical of the federal system of the United States, which, according to him, allowed for far too much division. He single-handedly wrote the constitution, which would stand for 51 years. When Afrikaner separatists attempt to claw, attempted to claw back the Transvaal, Smuts and Boerta dutifully put them down. The unity, even under dominion of the British, was paramount. The notion which he produced has been characterized, the nation which he produced has been characterized by long-running dominant party systems based on political philosophies which exist outside of the binary European political spectrum. To this day, the one issue all politicians concern themselves with is unity, a goal Smuts pursued asymmetrically, unequally, pragmatically, forcefully, and at the cost of his own liberal moral convictions. The fact is that no one in politics has any effective conception of how to combine all the divisive populations of South Africa into a single unity, nor even whether such a combination ought to be sought. General Smuts must have some systematic ideas on the subject because he's a philosopher, but his ideas do not find any place in his program. On, all the, important color, uh, on the all important color question, he has never risen above the merest opportunism. The result is that when he enters the political field, he leaves behind him the chief part of what differentiates him from his mole like fellow creatures. This third class performance by a first class mind is a curious and, from a public standpoint, distressing thing. This is an anonymous person who wrote into a newspaper in January 1929 called Gallio. I've seen it, it was quoted in, in a couple of books that I used for this thing. 
Uh, Jan Smuts believed, contrary to the easy caricatures we South Africans are painted with, that the races did not have any real differences, and that acculturation was all that was required to bring black Africa into the modern world, the development of their human personality. But he was firm in his belief that Africa was underdeveloped and needed a white aristocracy to guide them. As to integration, he was rather reluctant to meet the challenge and unwilling to face the reality of sharing power with black South Africa, which vastly outnumbered white settlers even then and were almost entirely illiterate, shared little common culture with white South Africa and had deep blood feuds to settle with men who had spent the, par uh, the prior three centuries crossing swords and muskets with them. I suppose if you've seen my videos, you can see that I recycled this little paragraph um, for my script. More immediately, he faced intransigent resistance from ordinary whites, and the consensus was that the race co races could not share political space. So he kicked the can down the road. As Prime Minister and head of the South African Party, Smuts ruthlessly put down the South African Communist Party and their white unions campaign for a white South Africa, defending the urbanization of the black population while compromising with the conservatives by offering them segregation. Now, these policies, as well as what seemed to be excessive appeasement of the British, resulted in him losing his office. But in true South African style, the two parties formed a grand national coalition to avoid Brudertwis, a strife between Afrikaners, and Smuts was almost continually in government in some form or other from 1910 until 1948. This uneasy alliance, intended to keep unity amongst the Afrikaners, required the passing of several laws to limit the disruption of white communities by the urban influx, and to make peace with Afrikaners who were outraged by their role in fighting for the British in World War I. Like other Western governments, Smuts gave the franchise to working men and women as a means of pacifying the working classes. But this created a racial asymmetry in what was until that point a fair system, supposedly, the non-racial Cape franchise, by offering the vote to all whites, but only a tiny minority of colored Indian and black voters, the coalition government was forced to acknowledge a different game. Whereas before, big men like John X. Merriman and Smuts himself had favored a gradualist approach to eventual racial integration, by handing the vote to all whites, they created a difficult political choice. Embrace racial equality on the ballot and immediate dissolution of the political order, or compromise by offering separate development. The 1936 Native Land Act and Native Representation Act appeased the Afrikaans' right by stripping the franchise and property rights from non-whites in most of the country's area, offering a limited political autonomy at the local level in the homelands. He authored these bills himself. Smuts had a close follower in Jan Hendrik Hofmeyer, a man of extraordinary capacity, whose academic achievements matched, uh, matched Smuts' own, but for one ingredient, imagination. Hofmeyer was the nephew of his namesake who spearheaded the Afrikaans language movement. Related by marriage to Smuts, he formed a formidable attachment to the man. His talents at administration and public speaking made him Smuts' right-hand man, consumed by a passionate belief in Smuts' liberal universalism, but by the light of an unshakable Christian virtue. He took Smuts more seriously by his word than Smuts did his own. And when, right, when voting rights of non-white citizens were stripped away, he was the only elected official to vote against the measures. Hofmeyer was dead set on uniting South Africa, and like Merriman before him, saw the Cape franchise, which gave voting rights to all propertied men regardless of race, as a means to slowly induct the whole nation into a Christian brotherhood through colonial trusteeship. He even attempted to break down the racial barriers through the use of united church conferences, but while his attempt to use Christianity to unite the country provided the first ecstatic experiences of national unity our broken bastard nation has ever tasted, it was a false hope of familial love which dissipated like the warmth of mother at the school gates as the curtains of segregation descended on the infant nation. Shame poor Hofmeyer, eh? Poor Hofi. In private writings, Smuts acknowledged that grand segregation was impractical and black urbanization was irresistible. When the notorious Fagan report came out in 1948 and trumpeted this fact from the rooftops, Smuts confirmed his recognition of it and fell into public ignominy with his people. Already raging at the betrayal of, voluntary, uh, of voluntarily serving the British in the Second World War, having suspected the nature of his dual loyalties for decades, Smuts was thoroughly tranced in the 1948 election. Okay, I exaggerated there. He won by a very slim margin. Um, by the new and fiery Nationalist Party, uh, chaired by a man from his tiny hometown, Francois Milan. Far from promoting harmony and holistic evolution, dragging all South African peoples towards ever closer unity, Smuts's compromises guaranteed the arrival of Grand Apartheid, 
His choices in 1936 formed the basis of Hrvud's dirty compromise between the Basque Cup model, which saw white men as eternal custodians of their colonial wards, and the purist model, which saw total separation into different states. He tried to achieve both, and as history has shown, failed miserably at each. In the First World War, Smuts's military acumen was re recognized by a su sufficiently large proportion of the British elite that he was placed on the War Council for the Empire. In 1917, Smuts spoke... I'm going to open this in a new, new tab, because that's actually worth checking out in a bit. In, 1970, uh, in 1917, Smuts spoke as a guest to a banquet held by the British Parliament. In the address, Smuts insisted that an empire was not what the nations of the Dominion were. He disliked the term, and a smack to him of a violent outward aggression of the, of the Germans. Germanism, it seemed to him, threatened the very foundations of civilization with its uncompromising outward expansionism. He referred to the colonies and dependencies as being different from the dominions, whom he saw as a community of nations, independent in character and government, and yet somehow part of a greater whole, a society of shared values whose common interests necessitate monarchy and a common foreign policy. Smuts introduced, for the first time, the phrase, the British Commonwealth, to describe the self-serving, uh, the self-governing dominions of Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and Great Britain, and sent a comprehensive memorandum to Secretary of State Amory in 1921, who immediately wrote back that he vigorously agreed to every point. Smuts's repudiation of the empire in favor of the Commonwealth and his belief in free, self-determined parts contributing towards an organic whole created the necessity of allowing mature nations their own freedom. For this reason, Smuts intervened in the Irish War of Independence. While the government of Lloyd George insisted on smashing the Irish, many significant people from Robert Cecil to King George V and the general public found the policy too harsh and longed for a settlement. The view of the free associating Commonwealth of Nations, as opposed to a centrally governed empire, made Smuts attractive to Irish negotiators, and he was invited to advise and intercede by both the British authorities and the Irish Free State. He spoke privately to the King and drafted an address to the Belfast Parliament. Belfast Parliament. He then wrote to Lloyd George, telling him bluntly that the forcible suppression of Irish autonomy would run counter to all British governing principles and would undo the empire. As Churchill wrote later, no British government in modern times has ever appeared to make so complete and sudden a reversal of policy. Smuts became the intermediary between Eamon de Valera and the Crown, convincing the highly suspicious and radical de Valera that it would destroy his diplomatic reputation to decline in negotiations, and even convinced him to drop Ulster from the claim of independence. The plan which hit Amory's desk in 1921 laid out almost every key position, uh, almost every key proposition for what would become the Balfour Declaration of 1926, including, as Smuts was an enthusiastic Zionist, the notion of a Jewish nation state, though his proposal of a codified Commonwealth constitution did not make the final cut. The significance of his impact is particular since two years prior to Balfour, Smuts was voted out of office, and in his place, the truculent nationalist Barry Herzog was in charge, who favoured the dissolution of empire. Smuts foresaw a gradual promotion of all British colonial possessions to the same status they, um, as they had as it, no, to the same status as they became civilized and modernized by a British elite. And indeed, as the empire wilted in the heat of German fire, the Commonwealth braced to afford equal status to all nations who wished for independence. He saw the greater mission of this Commonwealth to be greater freedom and self-development. He saw in this Commonwealth the nucleus for the world government of the future, the true League of Nations. And here's another little section from him where he says, Again you see a problem in holism. Where there should have been united family of nations, we saw the elements drifting apart. We saw disunity and disruption, and we saw in the end the greatest crash in the history of the world. When the Great War ended, there was the same problem in holism. I think the League of Nations is a genuine effort in reconstructing the broken front of European civilization, of once more reforming unity out of division and discord. When the ashes of the European conflagration had settled, Smuts was placed ideally. His powers of personal persuasion were strong enough to gain the ear of Woodrow Wilson, and subsequently the authority to draft what would be the outlines of the legal powers of the League of Nations with the explicit intention of liquidating and replacing the nations of Europe with a new holistic dispensation. 
If this advance is not made, he predicted, this war will, from the most essential point of view, have been fought in vain, and more calamities will follow. He wrote the first draft of the covenant himself, and in the notes of his initial outline, he proposes not just collective security, justice, and conflict resolution, but an irresistible penetration into every aspect of the life of the states which made it up. Smuts's draft proposals to global unity and eternal peace had a profound effect on the Levite Treaty of Versailles. His advice was the dissolution of the central powers and a combination of nationalization, direct oversight, uh, of nationalization direct oversight mechanisms to suppress German industry and military powers. Wilson's most, Wilson, these were Wilson's most favored proposals. He also prescribed the membership of stateless nations such as the Jews and other ethnic minorities and asserted the right of self-determination of nations, making annexation an illegality. Hannah Arendt uh, sharply observed that rights with nobody to enforce them are of little value, and once Germany decided the League was a paper tiger, the stateless national councils were of little importance. This echoes the situation in South Africa only too clearly. The evil of empire, as he saw it, was in its character of overgrown nationalism. So, the gradual sublimation of nationality into global citizenship was conceived as a solution to all the bitterness of blood endemic to man. This logic of an evolution of all peoples in a managed way towards union in a stable holistic human society mirrored his concepts of nature and his attempts to implement them in South Africa. This logic made him deeply antithetical in spirit to the rise of fascism, which he regarded with unrestrained bile. I quote from Peter Anker's fascinating book, Imperial Ecology, Smuts had no sympathy for or contact with German National Socialists, who may have been inspired by holism, ecology, or other green views. Instead, it is remarkable that Smuts noted as early as April 1933 that Hitler, with his ruthless barbarism and with his baiting of the Jews, would carry Europe back into the Middle Ages and may cause an orgy of racial politics in South Africa. There is not one line of support of Nazism in his public speeches or private correspondence, nor did his constituency support Hitler, who had greater sympathy amongst nationalists. Moreover, Smuts gave qualified support to the Spanish coalition government in their civil war, because they were fighting the impending danger of a fascist regime. Smuts's firm rejection of fascist and Nazi regimes did not imply any support of socialist ideas, nor did Soviet and other Marxist intellectuals support holism. In the late 1930s, he was still critical of all kinds of socialists, particularly H.G. Wells, whom he saw as a leading socialist promoter of the general trend towards our fundamental human rights. This is very interesting because his ideas are very similar to Fabianism, and yet he rejects the Fabians like Wells. It's a very interesting one. It sort of paints him as someone who's got a very, very clear idea of where history and global institutions are going. This prescient view and his prior influence allowed him tremendous influence later when the opportunity arose to, pre uh, to present the preamble to the United Nations Charter, the document which outlines the values upon which the entire edifice of the current global governance system was founded. But it came through in his political writings and holism and evolution was banned in Nazi Germany. Now, this is important. I personally think that guiding documents are carry far more weight than people give them credit for. So I'm, I'm sort of looking over here. We find, instead of hostility, which is felt in life, that this is a friendly universe. We are all interrelated. The one helps the other. It is an idea that gives strength and peace and is bound to give a more wholesome view of life and nature than we have so far. Organized, tolerant coexistence is the rule and destructive warfare the exception, resorted to only when the balance of nature is seriously disturbed. You know, Mr. Beale, tra you know, wading in with his objections to the technocratic management of the country, which is pouring money down the drain in people's lives into the gutter. Mr. Beale must not disturb the delicate balance of nature, you see. When World War II broke out, Smuts was appointed field marshal in the British Army. His choice to enter the war on the side of the British was an outrage at home but he pursued it because he believed that Hitler was evil, and above all, a threat to the vision of a united global peace. Like his position in the war rooms of, of the Great War, Smuts's position at the forefront of the British Imperial War strategy placed him directly in the centre of the peace negotiations. 
The meeting of America, Britain, Britain, China, and Russia at the Dumbarton Oaks to discuss a new, more comprehensive League of Nations resulted in bitter argument and little more than vague gestures towards universal values. The role and contribution of Smuts was the same he played in formulating the Union of South Africa, the League of Nations, and the British Commonwealth. He would stroll in while all parties were in the process of agreeing to broad principles and present a comprehensive, fully drafted plan. The Atlantic Charter which preceded these negotiations did not even mention human rights, and the Dumbarton Oaks draft mentioned human rights only once as a throwaway line in the midst of a discussion of an economic council. Smuts saw that what was missing was a statement of religious intent. The religion was that of human rights, over which the war was supposedly fought and which only a firm philosophical commitment could address. Of course, everyone knows that World War II was not fought over human rights, but economic and geopolitical interests, but be that as it may. His statement of the new doctrine was laid out in the language of global materialist faith. While Sir Charles Webster was tasked with writing the British proposal, he lost his copy during the conference and took a copy of Smuts's. While he made some stylistic changes, it remained mostly Smuts's work, he even managed to sneak in references to his notion of the development of the human personality. The Americans added a couple of flourishes of their own, and reverting back to Smuts's original opening line, we the people of the United Nations. But it is to Smuts's April draft that we can commend this extraordinarily utopian political promise. We believe in the enlargement of freedom and the promotion of social progress and in raising the standards of life so that there may be freedom of thought and expression and religion, as well as freedom from want and fear for all. As the United Nations Conference on International Organizations opened, Smuts's fever Smuts feverishly spent his time running between committees, working to shape various legal aspects of the UN Charter, including strengthened economic frameworks and stronger security provisions. Being the only still living signatory of the Treaty of Versailles and a personal friend of Winston Churchill, Smuts made waves and he was listened to. As fluffy and insignificant a philosophical declaration of values may appear to the common legalistic mind, it has in fact had an unbelievably far-reaching consequence for the formation of global policymaking, no more so than at the end of the Cold War, when the world was being remade anew. The phrase, freedom, freedom from fear and want, was not forgotten. Five decades later, the UN Development Programme quoted it as the essential purpose for their comprehensive targeted governing scheme, which knit together aspects from every sphere of human life under the single umbrella of human security. They quote the American Secretary of State in June 1945, who, as you can see, is quoting Smuts. The battle of peace has to be fought on two fronts. The first is the security front, where victory spells freedom from fear. The second is the economic and social front, where victory means freedom from want. Only a victory on both fronts can assure the world of an enduring peace. No provisions that can be written to the Charter will enable the Security Council to make the world secure from war if men and women have no security in their homes and jobs. Kind of true. But, caveats I'll bring up later. The origins of their comprehensive development program is found in the 1972 Stockholm Conference, where the use of the term comprehensive security placing the economic interests of humanity on par with the existential threats from war and tying these to the core duties of the UN first appeared. This curious development whereby the UN took on the goals of the socialist international as a categorical imperative resulted from the developments in the United States the previous year, when a policy program developed by the Environmental Protection Agency used Malthusian arguments of a human catastrophe proceeding from the abuse of the environment to create a and fund a holistic ecological management system. This gained traction with the military, who had already begun expanding their notion of national security to include every measurable aspect of human, animal, and plant life, air, water, and soil. As Bill McSweeney put it, it was a political decision in search of a the theoretical foundation. In the UNDP's post-Soviet policy framework, it was transformed into the UN's current mandate for human security, transforming wealth redistribution into a human right, and of course, tying it to ecological balance. And so, uh, in, um, in the words of um, um, Dellingpole, um, watermelon politics, green on the outside, red on the inside. 
Today, Smuts is barely remembered, and where he is, as in the fallest protest at UCT, his portrait was burnt and his bust was painted red. His family have preserved his house and commissioned a tin-eared old-fashioned documentary on his life. But as much as they try, his memory will not be redeemed. His grand unified theory is esteemed by neither science nor philosophy, and his wife's work is esteemed by very few historians. But he shaped every institution he touched, and left a long, strange, and misunderstood legacy. Irony of ironies, Jan Smuts found that his ideals came back to bite him. His promotion of universal liber uh, liberal idealism was overshadowed by the iconic reputation as the man who jailed Mahatma Gandhi and became the architect of apartheid, although today that epithet is usually reserved for Hendrik Verwoerd, who in reality was really just cleaning up his mess. What is more, the human rights doctrine of the United Nations became the very mechanism by which South Africa was condemned on the international stage and the philosophical grounds for the new constitution of 1996, which promoted all forms of positive human rights enshrined in the preamble to the UN Charter, written so many years before, ratified by a black parliament in Cape Town and a black president in Pretoria. Um, yeah, and then this is about sort of uh, an introduction to an article I haven't written, which starts with the Wageningen soil, global soil mapping project and moves on to um, other things um, but uh, that's th I mean, it's, it's a long article of course uh, I know people are saying citation needed but those are, so the in the link below it's a link to the, the article that I wrote and all of the little pink thingies little pink links are links to articles that discuss or books that discuss uh, these ideas in, in, in more detail I mean this is not an academic article this is me discussing how I interpret these things based on a limited number of sources. But I mean, I, I in, in defense of my position here, if you read older academic sources from like the 1930s or 40s, you don't find like a giant forest of citation under your writings. What instead you get is like, a, you'll get maybe like 30 or 40 citations at most. Um, I mean, it, so I, I, I don't feel like I've done too badly in defending my positions over there. Um, if you if you want citations but let me just go up to the top and then i can answer some of your questions because i think that'll be nice um okay krianda uh duke of south orion constellation old futuristic sci-fi movies display this as well yeah 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 there's a big thing of that um i mean star trek has got that whole sort of you know starry-eyed liberal futuristic idealism going on um yeah i have been gifted a beautiful pastel of elephants which beyond belong to smuts well well i mean i don't know if you're on uh, if you're on twitter or anything but if you can take a photograph and reply to you know to tag me i'd love to see them um so some of the variatus um a pleasant voice for narrating you're too kind don't worry about it in a perfect world, the enlightened humane philosophy of the Obas would have delivered to our days a more equitable and peaceful nation in a global order of exceptional justice. Unfortunately, the reality in stark contrast, although hypotheticals should be avoided. If Smuts could have witnessed the British Empire's betrayal of Rhodesia in Africa, hmm, okay, you see, I don't think so. I think he would have sided with the Anglo-American trans uh, transnational hegemony. Because in his mind, it is about subsuming everything into this higher sort of conglomeration of holes. And in many ways, he, he did betray South Africa quite thoroughly. Um, a reasonable person who was, who was building South Africa um, in respect of the people on the ground would have given it a federal constitution um, and would have had a minimal central government. And you would have had all of the different. You, he would have, if he was, if he was, um, if he was sensible and generous. He, oh, sorry, if he was just sensible, he would have actually carved up the old Boer republics and 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 so on to give contiguous territories to to the black tribal areas, so that they'd each have their own little nations. But he didn't do that. Instead, he carved it up to give maximum space to the economic interests of. Uh, white South Africa, and then stripped the 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 the, 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 um, the Boer republics themselves of any uh, of local autonomy. So everything becomes 
nationalized. Everything becomes centralized in Pretoria. Um, and what you end up having there is one in which no one can actually express any any sort of centripetal force. They can't pull away from the center effectively. So everything becomes a battle over Pretoria. And you see this again in the new constitution. There's very little devolution. Um, however, there's a very strange development in which we ended up giving the municipalities a hell of a lot of power. And then there's been a couple of court developments recently, like from places like Kolobeni, where you've had clashes between uh, people and mining interests, um, where the courts gave the local communities the power to decide whether or not major development programs occur in their communities. And so it, it kind of rev it actually kind of forces those tribal authorities, which still resemble the old sort of colonial model um, today. Um, it forces them to actually behave more like their traditional um, ancestors, which is where they have to seek the consultation of the ordinary people in order to do anything drastic like that. Um, whereas during much of the, the 21st century so far, they've been handed powers of modern states, but at a local level. And what that does is it hands chiefs way more power than they ever held before. And it's extreme. It, it it it's allowed them to to, to get away with some very very nasty stuff. Ah, Gabe, you're being too generous here. The most underappreciated channel on YouTube. Um, I don't think so. I mean, look, if you if you want to talk about underappreciated channels, there's one that I found which was, and I've lost the bastard. He did an amazing breakdown. Where he went into the um. He went into the methodology and he found people inside John Hop Johns Hopkins Hospital who were talking about um, methodological fraud in in um, measuring COVID cases. But I mean, like, how do I know if that's not a trick of my memory? You know what I mean? Because I don't can't remember where the channel was. There's also fellows like Otto Paul, who's a um, uh, who I'm actually going to be interviewing tomorrow. Um, and he he's he's an incredible student of like Soviet history and all this kind of so on, and he's an independent scholar, which means he doesn't ask permission from you know um, established institutions for what he's doing, and he's he's quite unafraid of tackling rather taboo subjects, and his big specialty is um, racial segregation policies in in Soviet Union, and he compares it to the apartheid segregation system. I thought that was amazing, and. Um, yeah, I, I like independent scholars. I think they're really good. I like the guy who, um, one of my favorite guys is actually Justin Murphy. I don't watch him that often anymore, but just as sort of like a scholar that I admire that broke out of the system and carved his own path, I really like I really like what he's doing. And he's he very much is bordering on polymathic because he, he goes into areas like uh, artificial intelligence, into polling science um, and elections and how what changes people's preferences in that realm and also more abstract theory uh, abstract things like um you know postmodern philosophy um and um also like lifestyle stuff and religion and he's very very broad he's extremely accomplished and i think he's he's underappreciated justin murphy look look for him um yeah, okay, Viriatus. Uh, the horrendous violence enacted upon the humble Afrikaner who willfully surrendered his republic at the peak of its power. The outstanding intellect of Jan Smuts may have joined the German cause with the hindsight of our dead. No, no, I don't think so. Um, I think that you'll find more in common between the German maneuver and the Afrikaans nationalist maneuver. Because I mean, Smuts fought for his people, but the second he got he got a chance uh, to really make a decision on how society was going, he said, "Well, you." Uh, he tried to make them give up everything that they'd fought for, which I think was it's extremely strange, and it's it's hard to comprehend exactly what was what was going through his mind during the during those years of the Boot War. I'm really not sure because that tension must have been something incredible. It's not, he didn't just, it's not like he just got on the battle and he was an armchair general. I mean, if you've read Denise Reitz's book, Commando, which I encourage everyone to do because it's a very short book. I lost it in the post, unfortunately. I am absolutely 
wouldn't over it because of South African Post Service. See, a pile of books behind me there. That used to have a whole bunch of really, really kiff stuff in it um, that I've lost um, because it because it didn't make it over here. I lost about a fifth of fifth of my book collection um, when it came up. One of it being the Donatorator's Commando, which I got as a birthday present, I think, for my 20, 20, 20th or 21st birthday. <sighs> yeah. I mean, like, he, he went with Smuts on, on the guerrilla campaign, and it's shit like, you know, you trek until he the clothes literally rotted off their bodies. And they were walking around naked with just like a, a tattered blanket around them. Do you, I mean, like, if you can comprehend... The, the level of dedication and roughness required to fight that and think Smuts went through that and then betrayed and then betrayed his people for some kind of ridiculous abstract philosophy. I mean, it's and you, you can't say he betrayed him for money or he betrayed him for power, because all of it is written in his very, very detailed and sensitive and complicated political philosophy. So Whatever he's dealing with is something much more profound. That kind of decision making that he went into, I think it's it it requires um, it, it's quite a conundrum. And I think that Smuts really is kind of a mystery. Smuts was backed backed by the Rothschilds. That really doesn't explain how the, the, that similarity between that really doesn't explain the matchup between his theories and reality. Um, and also I'm, I'm suspicious of a lot of these things. I mean, like I know that the Rothschilds are big fellas and they put money in a lot of places and similar, similar powers and whether they're German or Jewish or French or British, although the Brits and the Germans are, are the big buggers you actually really have to watch out for, um, as much as everyone likes, but paying attention to the Jews. And nowadays it's the Chinese, Chinese or. Anytime you see a Chinese name behind something in international politics, it usually means trouble. But um, I would be cautious of saying, oh, it's all the Rothschilds, because this is just, it's just too simplistic. It doesn't help you understand why institutions take a particular shape. You know that there's a transatlantic um, cap uh, sort of capital um, system. You know that it has certain ethnic characteristics that... Um, the change in terms of balance over time. And I think imagining that it's like the Jews is, it doesn't really cover everything. It really doesn't. And I mean, if you look at the most powerful man on the planet today, in my opinion, after Xi Jinping would probably be um, uh, Joseph Schwab. And he's, he's not Jewish. He's a, he's a German. He's a, with weird occult sort of, tastes um that i don't know how to quantify but the I, I i don't think i don't think making an ethnic argument at that level of social abstraction right at the top of the the, the global hierarchy when you're looking at those that real sort of like oligarchic crowd i don't think that ethnic ethnicity really helps you navigate that one very well um I think that those people really scorn those of us with any kind of roots. They have absolutely no interest in um, in earthly traditions. They they really see themselves as being far above all of this shit, you know. So yeah, Nigel Soden has a nice fat comment for me. Um, since man has been able to record events in the material of various substances, there has never been harmony amongst the spices called man. <laughs> they are with spices, hey? No. Uh, there will always be a group who will rise and take dominion. Um, sort of, um, if you can see nations as in bulk. But, I mean, if you go back to even Roman times, you always see a sort of the, the ties that bind at a local level become weaker at the top and once the roman republic started falling apart you see much more um foreigners in the in uh, as the institutions collapse right because during the roman empire you've got emperors who come and go and underneath you've got all of these formal sort of formal ish institutions that resemble some of the institutions of the old republic but are just not really respected or used um not nearly in the same way. No one cares about them. 
but they still sort of hang on in. In fact, the Roman Senate itself persists until the modern day. It it went it it literally managed to survive all of the breakups of Italy and all this kind of stuff, and you it always managed to survive in some form. So the Roman the Roman Senate is a really really impressively interesting historical um, artifact. But my point is that they can often just become empty shells that are used by um, bigger powers. And um, um, I think the thing is that you do get you do get dominant ethnicities. Um, and I think the English civilization, if you include America as a sort of uh, sub civilizational nation, if you look at English civilization, it really, really, really did dominate from you know the mid of the middle, late middle of the nineteenth century until um, until very recently. Um, really, really complete domination. And so I think you're right in a general sense, but you've always got to remember that as things start falling apart, um, you and I think the big sign that that things are falling apart is that the English civilization has a tradition of common law. And almost everywhere in the former uh, in, in in the former English civilizations, you're seeing a collapse of common law and a replacement of it by sort of bureaucratic diktat. Um, you know, so all of these things like property rights, um, you know, you know, uh, habeas corpus, all of this kind of stuff, which was sacrosanct like a generation or so ago, is just meaningless now. No, no one cares. Um, it's only amongst the wealthy where where legal cases matter. That these things are really treated with a great deal of sort of honor and respect. Um, I mean, the coronavirus laws are an extraordinary example of things where just no one in any position of authority and the entire sort of global elite just looks at it and goes. And I mean, here in South Africa, we abolished the common law right of um, uh, what's it called? Um, um, Oh, come on. Come on, Rob. Your brain is completely falling apart. Uh, counter spoliation. That means you're allowed to basically defend your property and prevent people from destroying it. So you're literally not allowed to do that. I mean, it, the, the the whole sort of those cases uh, with the shacks in in the Cape, it's, it's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um from Christian Pretorius, in September 1939, Smut secretly shipped all the gold available in South Africa to America on board the U.S. battlecruiser Quincy to fund Britain's war. Yeah, oh. yep, yep. No, he believed in it. He believed in it with 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 such cast iron conviction. Um, and uh, it it was really extraordinary. In order to cover the budget deficits, the um, the, the the negotiations that that Jan Hendrik Hofmeyer had to un undertake with the mining sector extraordinary. He was running, I think there were like uh, twelve or thirteen portfolios um, in the government at the time, and he was running seven of them concurrently. And uh, a lot of people said that he he easily aged a decade during that period of his life. Um, and he he had kidney problems. He had persistent kidney problems as a result from the overwork. And I suspect it might be that he just wasn't drinking enough water. Which I mean, as a as a and and those health problems killed killed him eventually. Um, very very sad. A man of that talent being misused in such a way. I mean, to have to have a, a mentor like Smuts misuse him for the uh, as an instrument of a political system that would, you know, go to violate all of his. Oh, it's not really. It's, it's awful. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Um, that expression encompasses the very fabric how peace could possibly... No, that's incorrect. Terrorism is a an objective military tactic where some somebody enacts, uh, enacts extraordinary violence on some target, okay, some victim, in order to coerce some audience, okay? So is that you've got to imagine that, uh, that triangle of terrorist, um, victim, and audience. And that that's that's the that's what terrorism is. Now you can do it as a state, and I mean maybe I could do you a nice little reading from um, at some point if you guys are interested. I could do a reading from Peter Stiff's book on um, 
uh, called Warfare by Other Means, because there's a couple of really interesting stories of South African state terrorism during the apartheid era. Um, so you can see that, I mean, terrorism is not done by states or people. It's done by people, you know, whether it's state or non-state actor, it's terrorism. That quote, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, comes from um, the Arab nation's response to the Palestinian Liberation Organization um, murdering Israeli athletes in the Berlin Olympics in the 1970s. I can't remember which year it was. But what they said basically is you can't condemn it because, like, they're freedom fighters. I disagree. That is terrorism, whether you think that it was justified or not. There's a truth. You don't get to you don't get to fudge that kind of stuff. There are only few words that you can sort of redefine in that manner because those words literally just mean wrong, like murder. Whether something is or isn't murder is a matter of debate because murder is wrongful killing, morally wrongful killing. Theft is wrongful appropriation, right? So all of these things can be uh, can be contextualized and relativized, but not terrorism. Terrorism is a specific act. It's objective. We, we don't discuss it, and I'm not going to let some lunatic... Um, I'm not going to let some lunatic who, who endorses suicide bombing tell me how I'm going to define ordinary human English language, you know. Just not my vibe. Ah, yes, uh, yes, Gareth, the irony, the irony. Boy, historian David Irving is... <laughs> Lol, I'm not even going to entertain that. Um, if you really want to go through David Irving, we can maybe do, we can maybe say that for another time. But I don't think very much of him at all. Really, really don't. If you if you want someone who's unafraid of going through official statistics with um, with with the Holocaust, you can you can look at Otto Pohl. And um, I've I've seen him remark a couple of times that the figure of six million is is not accurate, but that the the reasonable estimates are between five point one and five point eight million. There's no doubt that the Holocaust really happened. There's no doubt whatsoever. And David Irving, with his ridiculous, um, with his ridiculous sort of intrusions, I think is, I think he's farting against the wind. Um, I, I don't know. There's too many people who've got a bone to pick with the with the with the current narrative. But instead of going about it a smart way and trying to sort of tear it apart, you, you can see really really interesting deconstructions of the post-war. Um, uh, of the post-war anti-German narrative um, by people like Men uh, Curtis Yarvin. He did, a, he did a stream with Michael Malice a while back where he talked about looking at German, uh, looking at anti-German propaganda in the lead-up to the war and saying, well, no, it clearly wasn't to save the Jews. Everyone knows this. Um, pe people went in the war to... Uh, and, and then there's another, there's another approach as well, which... Um, a very, very good channel called The Academic Agent um, has brought up as well. And what he points out is that the reason that Stalin and uh, Hitler were opposed was not because they were cruel and violent, but because they compromised business interests in the transatlantic community um, with their sort of very, very strict economic autarky. See, those are uh, those are unconventional models that you can use to, to to structure it. You don't have to going after going after the the Holocaust and denying it is, in my point, in my view, stupid. If you can't find a way to poke holes in the sacred narrative that we've got without uh, resorting to conspiracy theories um, that cannot be proven, um, then then you're going to lose that. But you're going to really lose that battle, and. I don't think it's worth fighting, and I don't think it's worth um, saying any dumb shit. If you want to get, uh, there are plenty of people who've done, re like even ordinary people who are not like professional historians, have done really, really great work at poking holes in these sort of amateurish attempts to um, to debunk the Holocaust. I mean, it's it's really childish, as far as I'm concerned. I don't. Uh, I think. You know, the idea that, like, oh, we're we going to be edgy, we're going to go against the sacredest of sacred cars. Well, I mean, why do you think they use something? Why do you think that people who are constructing these narratives use something like that? They're not going to use something that's an obvious, stupid lie. They're going to use something that's real 
to structure the, to structure their narratives. You know, it's it, the only time that you can really um, the only time that you can really see something that's that, that's very very easily bullshit is with something like. Um, I'm going to be careful how I phrase this for the purposes of, of internet censorship, but with the um, with the current uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, viral issue, the current sort of viral issue, we can see that the justifications for the policies enacted do not match the risk management, um, do not match the the scale of risk that have been accounted for. But like, and then like, almost everyone can see that. Um, the justification is just not there. So I, I'm not going to go into, you don't need to go into pretending that it was manufactured, it was sort of synthesized in some secret military base or anything. Um, there have been plenty of global, like little global pandemics before, like swine flu or H1N1 or SARS, whatever. They killed a fair number of people, and there have been even bigger ones before we were paying attention to this as like a systematic global risk. You know, if you go back to, uh, there, there's a big flu in 1968 that killed more people than this. There's more deadly than this. Thing is how people use facts. So ideology manipulates facts in order to justify power. And it doesn't matter whether something's, it, you, you don't always have to sit there and debunk facts. If it's a fact, it's a fact, accept it and move past it. If you, if you're interested in getting out of how you're being manipulated by people in power, you have to first be able to stand on real facts and i don't think it's worth fighting i don't think it's worth fighting battles that are lost you know um i think it's very stupid and also i mean like it's it's clearly like i i person I, I can tell that most of the time people talk about that shit it's motivated by resentment and spite get over it you know um we, we've got there are bigger battles to fight and you know there's there's more complex stuff and personally i think most people should uh, if, if you're looking at all the transnational stuff you know always be tying it down to your local context if you can't find if you can't find how it's manifesting in your local political context and you maneuver against that then all of that sort of high level conspiracy theory and i say i, I say conspiracy theory in a neutral sense in that there are some true conspiracy theories right all of that high-level conspiracy theory, it's um, like about uh, about global control, World Economic Forum, things like that. Um, you have to be careful how you tie the, how you describe um, the connections between um, ideology, interest, institutional policy, um, uh, chance. Even there's a lot of there's a lot of random variability in the system that people can't account for. I mean, remember I told you about. Um, uh, the fellow who lost his notes, and because of that, Smuts's preamble gets used. Like little things like that, that have, that like can have absolutely transformative effects on the shape of institutions to come. So don't discount the uh, the, the the elements of chance that come into these things. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Smuts, Rhodes, and Oppenheimer. Yeah, Oppenheimer was a big was a big shot in those days, wasn't he? um yeah no um but uh, i mean like the oppenheimer family is still still big shots in um in south africa today um there's um at the moment i think a lot of people particularly in in black nationalist circles are aware of these people so the black nationalists like keeping an eye on these fellows because and uh, trying to target their assets mm -hmm. You know, particularly Julius Malema has been looking at farms in, in Limpopo that are owned by people who are connected to the Stellenbosch Mafia and so on. And um, this little crew of ultra-rich South Africans, um, occasionally they're like meddling in politics for a sense of aggrandizement, but it's all like playground stuff to them, really, in my opinion. They don't really, they don't really make much massive sacrifice, and I think... Um, I mean, for that reason, I'm kind of like skeptical of someone like um, I'm skeptical of someone like uh, like Rob Hasselhoff. And if you look up Rob, Rob Hasselhoff these days, you get the, he's a very accomplished man, very talented, very intelligent, very hardworking. 
didn't make all of the stupid decisions I made, you know, in my life. And he had um, he had some good advantages, and he didn't pass up his opportunities. But uh, and he ended up working for Rupert Murdoch in his twenties. I mean, great way to start your career. So um, Rob Hasselhoff is big, but then he comes on instead of maneuvering quietly behind the scenes and sort of um, influencing things indirectly. He comes and does a tour of all the podcasts and goes on all of the um, goes on like goes on like Alec Hogg and basically does like this Bond villain speech where he tells he tells everyone how he's going to ride in on a shining steed and save South Africa with his money. And if you're going to be the money man then best keep it quiet, you know. Um, I mean, that's just my opinion. I, 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 I can't, I can't lecture him. He's older than me. He's been around longer than me, and he's privy to uh, to secrets that I'm not privy to. Um, but I still don't think it's the best idea to do that kind of thing because, as you know, everyone on both sides of the sort of um, the melanin curtain um, have like some uh, have, have a fixation on manipulative elites, you know, and as we should be. Every culture should have been given the opportunity to self-actualize instead of being told how to live. Tools could have been shared to assist in development, but globalism, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, this is like NPF on Vaiklo's, um, like little quote about, you know, uh, an instrument in the orchestra of heaven. You know, every culture and every language and every nation people it's 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 lovely and poetic i honestly i really do like it but uh anthony Bortis, do you have a regular streaming schedule rob no i don't i don't want to i'm sorry <laughs> i'm not interested in trying to amass like a really huge uh, audience um so i'm going to give like a little bit of notice on twitter and then it's going to drop um because having having fewer than 100 people commenting is actually a, it's a crowd i can manage so I'm not trying to maximize my audience here. Just trying to produce decent content is good. Um, I think I saw that guy. He discussed the case risk of diabetes. Don't know. Um, in December 1901, in order to boost the flagging run of their troops, the three Rothschild brothers provided each soldier with a Christmas hamper containing sweet sessions to back a pipe. I'm putting in a back of cards. Ah, oh, cute. Yeah, oh, shame. They they're a really strange lot. Did you see recently when what's her face Rothschild? I can't remember her name. Uh, after after um, after Boris sort of gave up his policy programs, finally, uh, he ha held a press conference where what's her name Rothschild was standing directly over his shoulder and staring at him. You know, like that look that uh, Meghan Markle sometimes gives. Um, uh, Prince Harry, just sort of staring. At him, mm -hmm. Are you fo mm, you're re you're reading the script? Good, you're behaving yourself. And uh, and so he sort of got like that whole sheepish demeanor that he usually has, and he re basically affirmed all of the policies of the Great Reset. Um, and then went into and the following day he went into quarantine, despite already having had the virus. Right, he went into quarantine after coming in contact with an MP who supposedly had it. I'm thinking like. Why are you doing this? Surely, apparently, your immune system is supposed to adapt, which does not bode well for, for vaccination theories. If the official policy is that even after you've had it, doesn't matter, you're going to you're you're always going to be vulnerable to the virus, the virus never goes away, the virus is eternal. Uh, this just looks like the thing's gonna bloody hang out for, hang around forever. You know? I mean you listen to people at these. So I went to like a big fat international uh, college and I did my master's there and everyone goes on about the risk society. It's their favorite book. It's like, Ooh, all of the big shots at the UN and the WEF use this book and the EU. So we're all like very boned up. On it. Oh, genius, genius, genius. So it's like all of this kind of stuff where you use, you use systematic risk, uh, you use systemic risk and you sort of, you, there's no real threshold where you decide that a risk is too big. It's all about you have to constantly reduce all risk all the time uh, to the extent that you can afford to do so. And that just that what you do you use is use that to to crimp 
uh, the liberal principles. So liberalism is held up generally by the harm principles. You do what you like as long as you're not hurting anybody, right? But if your behaviors are risky, then it is potential harm. And potential harm is still harm, a category of harm, if you think of it that way. And so what they do is they use uh, they use models of systemic risk to introduce the argument that, yes, but your freedoms are harming people, so we have to take them away. And so it's a, it's, it's a very, very neat formula. And I think a lot of people don't think about it that way. They tend to look at it as like, oh, well, you know, we're doing good. We're looking after public safety. So... <laughs> Have you seen the book collection of Smuts in his house in Irene? Never been there, I'm afraid. Do you think Smuts really betrayed or due to his intervention, smaller cultures were left to exist? I think that his, I, I think he was too idealistic and too up his own ass. So if you, you look at how I mentioned the, his, uh, his thing of like, he wanted a unitary South Africa. So he wanted a holistic thing. That had a single top down. It's it's ironic, like all the things that he's describing he, himself trying to avoid, he actually puts into practice by trying to avoid it. So, you know, well, we don't want like we don't want an empire, so we're going to impose an empire over South Africa, and we don't want we don't want like a pluralistic system like the United States, so we're going to impose segregation instead. Like the. The, the double think involved there is just like I can see how he would see it and how it would make sense to him, but the outcomes just like any sensible, like common sense understanding of what he's trying to do is just broken. It's, so he, he completely destroyed the, uh, the capacity of South African communities to organically come together. You know, there were several in instruments that they could have used. They could have used... Um, real separate development from the word go and not just uh, and actually given generous portions of land so that these people would have had an opportunity to experiment with self-governing from really early on and then black south africa would have been better off than botswana or ghana already you know um by by all well or they could have possibly been at any rate um and he, or he could have gone the route of um, the Cape franchise, where only property holders have money. That's similar to what Rhodesia had in place. And he could have let um, a gradual evolution through the through the institutions as the um, come to place. Um, I mean, it's not ideal, but it 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 you know either of those options were things that he could have done, which would have gelled with his theory, gelled with what he wanted to do. But he didn't do it. He, it's like it's really retarded in a way are not all wars fought by empires of the riches found in the land and countries they wish to conquer i, mean, I guess but i mean you know once you're working at that level abstract of abstraction you're not really saying anything anymore are you um sorry to be a bit blunt there nigel but that's kind of that's kind of how i see it like um if you if you're saying things that are if you're saying things that are true of every case, but don't tell you how the cases differ, it, 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 you know, you use the word empire. If you don't have a technical use for the word empire, then all countries and all states just are empires. And then, do you know what I mean? Like, anyway, on the subject of a federated republic for South Africa, is it a coincidence that the nine contemporary provinces almost perfect demarcation of democratic divisions in the language of the union? I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think so. Although, um, I'd, I'd like to actually take time, because I have noticed that too, and I would like to have a poke around in um, in the people, in the departments that were demarcating that thing, cause, um, and, and look at what they were thinking, um, to see if there's any surviving minutes from those things, because um, the thought behind doing that is a really weird one, you know? It, it's considering the ideas that were bouncing around at the time of the new dispensation, that does seem rather unlike, that does seem re a really weird choice to make. So, yeah. Why did you choose Marobani as a label for child? It was, look, it was my handle before I decided to reveal my name online. And I, I picked it as a, 
Um, and so it's still my handle on Twitter, although my name and my face appear on there. Um, but it, it, it's a it's a Kosa word that means thief or burglar. Um, and it comes because I had a I had an incident. So one of my roommates at at, at university was a, a Kosa fella, and he um, he, he made fun of me a little bit because I'm Rob Marobane, you know, um, robber. You know, there's a whole sort of like play on words going on there. And what I did was I'd locked myself out of my room. And so I had to take a pair of screwdriver. I had to take a screwdriver um, and, a, uh, and a crowbar and I had to crow up the, um, the window in my room and then unscrew the burglar bars. And so he caught me doing this, and uh, he called me that for a bit. Um, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting nickname. I'll use that one. So that's that. That it's not, it's not remarkable. But also, you know, being a white person, you're a land thief, aren't you? So I just thought it it fit really well. Ah, uh, Robert, Matt, to Feldig here. You here live? See, good that you article and bespreekt. Yeah, thanks. Thank you well, Lodewijk. Yeah, and thank you for the um, gelegenheid um, mijn artikelen te bespreken um, op de Common Sense Society um, vroeger dit week. Dat was, uh, was heel leuk en ik, uh, ik heb het genoten. Ja, dat was, was heel goed. Um, a conscious character. Once, the, once a massive empire, now the English control an island the size of Michigan. Ja, yeah. I don't think they even control that. <laughs> England doesn't exist anymore, really. It's it's a fiction. They don't even very few of them even know their own culture. Um, completely deracinated, demoralized people. I mean, you know, the Australians are more English have more English left in them than the English do in in some ways, and so many of the Americans as well have have a lot more English left over them. The, the English are really damaged. Although the English is England is much more um, heterogeneous than people give it credit for. So there are lots of little pockets where you find little elements of traditional English society living, um, people who've got very, very serious historical memory. Um, and so there's a lot of richness left in England, but Eng England as a nation, as a cohesive, it's kind of dead. It's kind of dead. Um, airstrip one, you know. But it's not to say that there's nothing left. There's plenty left, and there's a lot of riches, over, cultural riches over there to peruse and enjoy before they all fade into the constant deluge of acid wokeness. Uh, our bugger, I never get pinged for these streams. It's okay, Lewis. You will be fine. Have to come back after you're done. Good day. God bless. Oh, thanks, man. Nigel, indeed, common law has been done away with, and what will replace it? New world communism. I think at some point I, I need to take time out to do to do this. There's a lot of research I wanted to do on the continuity between the Illuminists and the New World Order, and it's like th that's some very like Alex Jonesy tinfoil hat territory, but it's really interesting, and there are a lot of like deep um, similarities, not just in the general spiritual outlook of people who have new age beliefs and, 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 um, and the early founders of the, of the UN and, and then so on and so forth. But there's also, um, there's also very big similarities between, um, Adam Weishaupt's economic model, uh, economic political model and the W world economic, so the world economic forums, uh, economic and political model. The, the similarities are just crazy. Um, and it's like 250 years apart, 300 years apart, whatever it is. Uh, mm, Timo Bo, lovely to see you, man, and uh, happy birthday for recently. Uh, thoughts on the possibility of a war between Ethiopia and Egypt? Woof. Woof. Jumping into the big topics now, my friend. See, I'd have to do some research on that, but... Um, Maybe I can do, oh, I'd like to, I mean, like next week, one of the ones that I would like to do is a bit on uh, South Africa's integration and annex, sort of gradual annexation of Lesotho. Um, and so I think maybe I can find time to do something on, on Ethiopia and Egypt. 
um, if you give me enough time, although I think it'll be a few weeks from now. I think I'm going to still prioritize some of my own essays. Um, and then I'll, I'll dive into that. Um, but yeah, that's a hectic thing. The 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 dams. The the I, I I wonder. I wonder, and then I have no evidence for this whatsoever. But if I were Egypt right now, I'd be reaching into into uh, Ethiopia to fuck shit up, because the the dam project that the dam projects that Ethiopia has been putting into place just it threatens to completely eradicate Egyptian farming, and that's a big part of their economy and it's not just a big part of the economy most of their farmland is owned by the military the military really are huge in egypt so it's it's direct it's not just like some some sort of auxiliary thing that they can let go there it's real heartland territory there um in, in economic and, and governance terms so um i would love to see if there's actually a connection between the egyptians and um and the whole Tigray vibe going on down now. Um, Conscious Caracal, in the th thumbnail of your blog post on Smuts, he actually has a very short shadow. Ah, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, funny. Uh, Jonathan Paul says, hi, lovely. I'm going to see you tomorrow. Thoughts on death threats to Malema. I've never, I, I, it's, it's weird. I've never seen, I've never seen a South, a white South African text like that. It just feels a bit off. And someone using, uh, using the accusation of racist right next to the K word. Just like it doesn't click for me. There's something, there's something Fong Kong about that. You know, there's a possibility that it is, but I don't know. My gut says it's, 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 I, I call shenanigans. I mean, also, who the hell has, who the hell would be able to hack out Malema's private number, but would write like some semi literate bloody high school dropout? Uh, it's add two and two together. This is this is I, I, I call shenanigans on the whole thing. Um very artist terrorism is the strategy of cowards. No, it's the strategy of asymmetric warfare. If you're if you have a big government and you're facing a, a large number of incorrigible subjects, you know, you use terror in order to get them in line. Maximilian Robespierre. Right, if you are a little dude and your group is like fifty people, how do you maximize your impact? You do some big, nasty, horrible shit in public. Terrorism. I can't I, like. It's not. I wouldn't call it courageous because that uh, courage implies some heart in the matter, right? But it's certainly not a timid thing to do. You can't do acts of terrorism if you're a timid person. Well, I mean, look, okay, you can, but it tends to require a, a great leap of bravery to do something quite as violent and evil as, as terrorism. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's a hardened pursuit to repress the general group. Not always. If you look at the Middle East, terrorism can often radicalize more people to the support of the terrorists. And actually, it worked very well to do so in South Africa. So I think uh, I think the idea that terrorism doesn't work is it, oh, it it depends on the circumstance. It really does. If you've done enough legwork to build um, to build community ties and build legitimacy for the movement in uh, amongst a large portion of the population, by the time you move to something like terrorism you can get a lot of people on side and you can increasingly radicalize the base. So it entirely depends on the context, whether it works or doesn't work. Um, if you, if you have waning political authority doing stuff like that is going to, it's going to, it's going to wipe you out. So, I mean, the, the things like the Trojan horse massacres in, in, in South Africa would just, yeah, that, that was not a good look. That was not a good look. So, 
yeah, very difficult. <laughs> Someone said it in it. It's not me in it, but I agree. But uh, I'm not sure what you're quoting there. But uh, yeah, <laughs> correlation with surveillance capitalism. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. You know, there's a there's a lovely lineup between that and the, the global global governance thing. Uh, my parents still talk about how shit that '68 flu was and how everyone got it. Yeah. Um. And did they lock down the whole world for it? Not that I know of. Rion van Vuren. Do you see Hanakom saying Elon Musk? <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Uh, Joker like Hanakom, he doesn't have any... Um, he really doesn't... He's not all that important. I mean, I mean, you look at him when 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 um when when his colleagues throw racist comments at him in public. He just sits there and sheepishly takes it. So, well, I am very white. Uh, bloody tokens. Um. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, Nigel says, "Have you had? It, have you any faith in the future of South Africa? Will it be able to ride the current storm and find stability?" No, it'll break up, one way or the other. Even if even if the unitary um, sort of nation state remains in some sense, there will have to be a lot of devolution, uh, because what's coming what's coming next really is a breakup of South Africa. Um, it can be it can be as bad as total basket case with mass ethnic cleansing. Um, it could be as nice as a negotiated regionalization settlement. But yeah, it's 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 complicated. I think that um, I think there's a lot of factors to negotiate. Are you a poli sci or historian? Yeah, political science. I did philosophy at undergrad along with politics and linguistics, and then at postgrad I did political science focusing on terrorism, um, and then I did my masters. My recent masters I did on. I, I don't know how to describe this course. It's called Crisis and Security Management, but it's it's like a lot of like European governance and a lot of like border security stuff and a lot of terrorism and policing and risk management. And um, there was a course on cybersecurity, which I took, which was quite fun. Um, but of stats, you know, it's, it's kind of like a mixed bag and for a lot of global governance things. I found that some really, really interesting shit. Um, Although a lot of the course was kind of disappointing because I hoped that it would be more practical and it tended to be very theory driven. We have to admit that even the right can fall prey to low, you know, low IQ, WMCS conspiracies. Yeah. If you compare like the white mono monopoly capital theory to, you know, what the Americans call the Zog, um, yeah, they, they, they match very closely. Um, I mean, look, no one's going to deny that the, the, you know, Jews float to the top in a lot of places. No one can deny that they have, um, they, they have sort of a, a good cultural memory for, uh, sustaining themselves as a diaspora population, but what form their sort of self-preservation takes in, uh, you know, their historical memory as a group, um, it's going to change from time to time, and I, I, I think that they're starting to lose purchase um, a little bit. I, I've noticed, I think a good sort of pulse on this is a really, really high-quality magazine called Tablet. I noticed a couple of months ago they pivoted really hard against wokeness, really hard. And I think part of that is because um, uh, you start to see black nationalists attack Jews in New York. But the thing is that international institutions are not backing away from this work stuff at all. And they're actually leaning much harder into the anti-Israel stuff and into the, um, uh, they're, they're leading very hard into that. Lot. So, so I, I, and I mean, like you look at George Soros and I've mentioned this before, George Soros is anti-Israel. There's a very clear picture that you, you can, you can see where, Jews are not getting protected by this by the Western political system 
very much anymore. They occasionally use them to hunt people down. If, they, uh, if the, the elite occasionally use them as a, as a sort of like shield to bash people with if, if they think someone's guilty of anti-Semitism so they can unperson someone. But the anti-Semitism out, uh, out of sort of the decolonial movement is extraordinary. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary. So I, I, like, I, don't, I, I don't think that you can really say that Jews are in charge of anything anymore. In fact, if anything, they're really, really losing their protected status in society. And it's a bad thing. I actually think that I, I, I tend to be very favorable to Jewish people, and I tend to think that it's a good thing to be a bit protective of, uh, of successful minorities, you know, because they are vulnerable and they do contribute disproportionately to society's goods. So I, if anything, I'm a bit of a philosemite um, rather than an anti-Semite. Um, if that bugs people and I'm not really, I don't really give too much of a fuck. Um, uh, yeah, check my, there we go. Conscious Caracal confirming my instincts. Check my latest retweet to Priya's that Julia sent a death threat to himself. What did I say? What did I say? First of May, seventeen seventy one. Okay, I'm gonna have to Google that because that that cryptic nonsense is is piquing my interest. What is this? Uh, Battle of Alamance. Is that what you're on about? Um, it's the Battle of Alamance. Let's see what what else is there. So I'm going to have to ring off soon. Um, no. Oh, come on. Why is my why is my thing going? Look, all I'm getting is the Battle of Alamance. If you if you can tell me what happened in on on first of May, seventeen seventy one, other than the Battle of Alamance, which I will look up and have a look through at some point. Um, then, great. Um. Conscious Carol doesn't surprise me he's so racist he hates himself. No, it's the the thing is that like much like other fascist movements, well, not like other fascist movements, how should I put it? Much like the German National Socialist Movement, the the, the EFF actually thrive on a, a victimhood narrative. Um and so they both say that we are the mo we are great, powerful, and everyone trembles before us, but also we're victims and we're in trouble. And so um but I think I think he uh, this is so dumb. This is so dumb. This is just too dumb for words. Um, thanks for the birthday wishes, by the way. Yeah, man, it's always great to see you. God bless. Um, uh, Viriatus, the uh, two world wars were a veritable fratricide of a white world. Had millions of European lives have lost, prospered, and progressed on the globe today would have looked vastly different place. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, you, you, if we had not had the world's greatest cataclysm, the world would be different. I mean, yeah, it was a race war between different right white nations. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, smuts, actually, this is what I wanted to do before I go. I'm actually going to touch on this quickly. There's a speech he, he had to the British Commonwealth Club. Let me do. Let me share screen because this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to share screen. We've got to like we've got like another twenty minutes before I log off. Um, share application Chrome tab, uh, British Commonwealth of Nations. Let me share this. So hopefully you can see. Um, so uh, yeah, so he he makes this really interesting speech uh, where he talks about like the spirit of comradeship and all this kind of bollocks. It's all about this is during the First World War, and he says. Germanism swept out. I mean, how's that, that for a um, how's that for a for a, for a statement? It is most essential that even on this bitter struggle, even when Europe is looming so large before our eyes, we should keep before us the whole situation. We should see it steadily and see it whole. I mean, my God, you can you can hear his he injects his stupid little philosophy into every speech he writes. I would ask you not to forget in these times that the British Commonwealth of Nations, do not forget the larger world which is made up of all the nations that belong to the empire. Bear in mind that after all Europe is not so large and will not always continue to loom so large as at present. 
So even now in the struggle of the peace, uh, the, the pace of Europe is being permanently slowed down. Your, emperor, your empire spread over all the world, and even where the pace is slowed down in one portion of it, it is accelerated in another. And you have to keep the whole before you in order to, to judge fairly and sanely the factors which affect the whole. I wish to say a few words tonight on the subject because blah, blah, actually, I'm just going to fucking skip. So he goes, um, uh, remember, it is not only Europe that we have to consider, but the future of this great commonwealth to which we all belong. It is peculiarly situated. It is scattered all over the world. It is not a compact territory. It is dependent for its very existence on worldwide communications, which must be maintained or this empire goes to pieces. In the past 30 years, you see what has happened. Everywhere upon your communications, Germany has settled down. Everywhere upon your communications of this world, the whole globe, you will find a German colony here and there, and the day would have come where your empire would have been in very great jeopardy from your lines of communication being cut. Now, one of the byproducts of this war has been that the whole world outside Europe has been declared of the enemy. Germany has been swept from the seas and from all continents except Central Europe. While Germany has been gaining grants in Central Europe, from the rest of the world she has been swept clean, and therefore you are now in this position, almost providentially brought to this position, that once more, you can consider the problem of your future as a whole. When peace comes to be made, you have all the parts in your hand, and you can go carefully into the position of what is necessary for your future security, and the future security of the empire, and you can say so far as is possible under the circumstances where you're going to keep and where you are going to give way. And he goes over here and he describes, so he's, he really does describe Germany as a threat to what he saw as the biggest engine for universal government, which is the British Commonwealth. And he was hoping for a world government through the British system. And so he, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's really, really whack. So yeah, no, he, he really gets into some weird shit there. But the whole idea of calling, like treating the German nation as having a tendency that he calls Germanism, which is like this, uh, vi which is like a, he treats it as like a violent, repressive excess um, of, of empire building, whereas the British Empire is a commonwealth. And it's, it's, it's really is like the self serving syrupy crap. I don't know if he really believes it or not. Um, but I mean, if you want to see how how ridiculously how ridiculously weird his 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 uh, global philosophy gets, you have to actually read Holism and Evolution because it is um, it is really hairy. I'm just going to ask a, answer a quick couple of questions before I read the the, the, the clo closing the, the closing thing from Holism and Evolution. Are the red telly tubbies a controlled opposition to distract the ignorant and desperate masses in a delusion by the terrorist? Calling them a controlled opposition would be I don't think it'd be accurate. So they have Julius Malema, if asked to say personally, I think he sees himself as the only legitimate ruler of the of the revolution, the only legitimate leader. He really does. And um a very, very radical opportunist. He'll take any, any opportunity in front of him to to gain power. So he but you've got to look at the pattern. So he wanted to take over from within by showing loyalty to the highest power in the party. And then when the highest power in the party didn't like him getting too hairy and threatening Botswana and make, making waves in the community, the, the, the national community, he um, Zuma purges him, so he takes most of the youth league with him. Then he starts attacking the ANC for its for its policies in Marikana and says, and, and the particular grounds on which he attacks them is saying they're too nice to whites. They're not do they're not fulfilling the charter. Then at a certain point they stop criticizing the ANC and they start attacking commercial entities, and they they you the the enemy ship. In my mind, what that that said is that particularly with with the rise of Sir Ramaphosa. You got you got a new sort of peace brokered between the two parties in order to consolidate um, uh, control of the National Democratic Revolution, and so they they become fairly chummy with each other. Have you noticed they were in lockstep on the whole? Um, sorry to use a bad pun, if anyone knows what that refers to. Uh, they were in lockstep on the whole um, lockdown um, program. Uh, very very chummy, um, and uh, you know. All of the attacks on 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 commercial entities, whether it's H or H and M or um, uh, or whether it was clicks, 
those were a certain point and then they pivoted again because now they're looking at the threat of Cape independence and, and regional autonomy and the DA becoming an intransigent regional party. And so they're looking to break them. And so now they're, they're, they're changing tactics and saying, okay, now it's people's war time. Um, we're returning to the 1980s. We're going to attack anyone who prevents us from dominating you. Um, and they're going off the like, actual soft targets like you know people outside of um like you know senegal and brackenfell those are not normal targets they've never done that before this is a new tactic and they can only do it with the um with the tacit approval of the anc or even even actually prior negotiation so i think that i think that what it says is that they're confident enough that the institutions are captured that they can act with impunity outside of the western cape and so then they're pressuring the Western Cape to conform to the NDR. So that's that's what I see. So I wouldn't call it a controlled opposition. I actually think that Malema's pulling, mo calling most of the shots in this, um, because the ANC can't control them. The the phrase that I would use is is the old fashioned one: the tail wagging the dog. How could South Africa achieve rapid economic growth like you see in China, Vietnam, Korea, etc. In the past, that's a difficult question. Um, if you look at what uh, if you look at what those people did, is they 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 centralized resources in a lot of um, in a lot of industries. It works if you've got a highly educated elite that have a have a completely identical picture. So the, the problem is that we're part of the West, and so we have this left right distinction, and so we have a lot of subversive elements in society um who would suffocate most efforts to actually have a serious corporate uh, with to do things either through a laissez-faire or corporatized economy uh which are two different routes to large and effective growth that we could take which are going to be very very difficult um as long as you have any lefties in your in your managerial elite um oh i sound like a lecturer <laughs> um yeah yeah the global political economy wait a minute did you ever did you ever get taught by um what if, if you're south african i don't know where you're from if you're south african did you ever get to you ever bump into harry stefan because that's his big thing he did global political economy uh he taught a course by that name at uct really really cool guy um the first time that I'd actually was motivated to actually work on something properly at, at um, like really, really hard. Um, I got a, I, I got a first for his class. I got the first highest mark in the class for the first time. Um, I'd always been like a real slacker and I sort of like pulled finger for that. Um, the deal was that he would give me a recommendation for a master's program. And my, my thing was that, it turned out I didn't actually need the recommendation, so that was fine. Um, um, okay, I doubt South Africa would break up without a massive civil war. Question is, who would be willing to fight and die for this specific nation? Very, yeah, very few people are keen. That's absolutely correct. Um, are you familiar with the works of Samuel Jared Taylor? Um... I mean, I'm aware of him, but I never—I was never interested in reading him. I like—I steer clear of most Wignat stuff. You know, if it sounds like Wignat's, you know, I don't. If if you want to, if you want to find interesting ideas from reactionary spheres, there's plenty of people to choose from. You don't have to go to that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, also the other the other thing is that you actually—it's—it's it's kind of a good idea to read from the left, despite what what despite what you might say marx has a lot to say he's not right about everything but if you look at particularly his early writings it tells you a lot about how the left think in a very very profound way um i think that i think that marx has his economics is bunk there's not really much worth reading in there um there's some stuff that's of historical um interest because he writes he he does a lot of journalism journalism work um so he's he's very good from that perspective, and he gives a very very good um, he gives a very very interesting account of the um, American Civil War. But if you want to have a good crack at him, just read his read his early manuscripts, like shit. Like uh, one of the best ones in terms of understanding how the left became in the twentieth century was is probably something he he wrote called 
Well, it's two things. So one where he wrote uh, hate on Hegel's philosophy of right, and then one he wrote called um, a ruthless criticism of everything existing. So I mean, th this is like if anyone tells you that critical theory isn't Marxism, I mean, just like read that. I mean, like, if you can if you can believe that that contradiction for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like it's it's there already. Uh, anyway, uh, Weishaupt started the Illuminati. Then he did, and it only lasted for twelve years. But the impact was very, very large. And I mean, you can see his ideas echoing throughout the the nineteenth century afterwards. It's really, really big. And I mean, his writings are available. It's not like they're hidden like stuff, I and mean, you can find them there online. Uh, the hectic civil unrest scares the grab out of you. Well, you have a very, very polite autocorrect on. Um, could be 7076. Okay. Um, uh, Ron Swart, whoops, late joiner here. How's it, everyone? No worries, man. Uh, what do you make of the DA statement by the referendum of the paper? It's a good start. Although, uh, you don't know, you never know if it's containment or not. Um, actually, the other thing that is a possibility is it could be a bargaining chip. They could be um, they could be using it to leverage for regionalism. You see, you, you can be using it as a bluff, or they could be serious because, frankly, they've got most of the infrastructure in place. All they'd need to do is declare a tax boycott, and they'd have de facto autonomy. So, um, I, and I think the ANC knows this, and I think the DA knows this, and I think that we are looking at a moment of negotiation that's quite serious. Um, although I always worry which direction the, the, the DA is going to go because the second that you have uh, international eyes on the country, all of the globalists are going to descend on you and all of your progressives in the party are going to be elevated by favorable conditions and then everything's just going to go wrong. Anyway, um, Red Sky Mana, this is what I thought. Western Cape is a huge threat to Malema now. What are your thoughts on the state of emergency declared and coming from Yeah, I mean, look, if, if the ANC really want to fuck shit up, they can deploy the army to the Western Cape. Because I know that the EFF is going to going to up their game because they're trying to instigate um, they're trying to instigate violence against them, and they're going to use women and children as shields, and they're hoping people get hurt and justify the deployment of the army, so that they basically have cover to terrorize people how they want. Because the, the, the provincial security cannot actually operate when there's a, there's a military around. Um, rules of engagement are changed. The people on both, both sides will fight. Yeah, yeah, problem. The furthest left that is safe to tread would be Mises and Rothbard, Ron Paul, Libertarianism. No, I look, I actually think that the, the, the acceptable window includes... Look... Is, you actually kind of have to know a bit of everything. You have to understand whether or not you are far right. The point is not to be far right for the sake of it. The point is to look at what is actually helpful and what's good for yourself, what's good for your people, what's good for everyone, really, and trying to try to figure out something that's, you know, sane and humane, you know? And if you have to, and, and for that, you actually have to, in order to understand, reason, find reasonable critiques, of the current system, whichever system that is, you have to look to the fringes, and you have to entertain um, people who've got really, really sound positions. And there are some, there are always extremists who are actually quite sharp. Look at Karl Marx; he's got shit to say. Um, he's dead wrong on like a huge fucking ton of shit, but he has he has shit to say, and he has really weird influences as well. I mean, you know, do you know that 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 Adolf Hitler's biggest um, Adolf Hitler actually wrote that. Um, where he, the point at which he realized that the Jews were the problem was when he read, you know, um, an essay by Karl Marx on the Jewish question. So if you want to see how things can get very, very weird. And so where ideas come from, where they go, if you want to understand how they function, you actually kind of have to look there. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't fancy, I don't fancy all that kind of stuff. Karl Marx is a Jew. Well, yeah, but I mean, like George Soros is a Jew, but he thinks that Israel should be destroyed. So you know, 
what does it really matter? You've got, I met people at university at UCT, white people who really just thought that it was our turn to go. So, um, you know, people's ethnicity doesn't actually tell you like a huge, doesn't really determine what they believe. It really doesn't. And if you want to understand things, you have to let go of that. Although look, ethnicity always has an influence. Can't run away from it. You can't scrub race off. People are going to notice that you're a certain race and it's going to affect how they think about you. And that, you know, affects the shape of society, you know? So I think, yeah. Is Russia a thorn in the flesh of the globalist and the left? Yeah. Look, you've got to see the globalists, the, the left as sort of like the, the willing idiots of the globe, uh, globalists. I mean, the, the, they funded the Bolsheviks. Right, the various like ordinary like banks and capital, you know, funded the Bolsheviks and got got a nice pound of flesh from them. They um, and I mean, it's not, these are not Jewish people. These are these are like Anglo bankers, right? English, Amer like wh white Anglo-Saxon Protestant banking unions, right? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant industrial companies and mining companies that got special concessions from from the russia uh, from from lenin's government to go and strip mine their soil in special areas with minimal tax stalin undid all of that which pissed them off a lot so you know we, these things get complicated and you look at almost every socialist movement it destroys the currency it destroys the economy and it lets foreign financial and industrial powers swoop in and take everything and, you know, you look at someone like Noam Chomsky and he says, ah, oh, the solution is more socialism, more autonomy. He's half right and half incredibly violently wrong. So, yeah, we're all actors upon the stage. You better own your Oscar. Yeah, politics is theater now because everyone's watching. It's very true. In conclusion, holism, British Commonwealth League of Nations, blah, 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 government authority, would be the target country that's in that it. The way, the way I'd look is um, uh, they are after the nation state, but they can use nation states provided that they have an open globalist policy system. You know, so like Brexit, they can cope with Brexit. And it throws a massive span in the works, but they can cope with it, you know. Uh, people forget that Brexit just gave you Brexit just opens the window. You have to actually get out of the minute. Yeah, you got to actually get out of the window and fly. It's way harder than it sounds. Um, Rome is the eternal dream. Well, yeah. Well, to close us out, I think I'm running well over time. I'm going to close this out and read the, the conclusion from Holism and Evolution because this is. Um, this is pretty kiff. So, where we go? We are on the right page. Reference must be made to the question before we conclude. Okay, so here's, here's his conclusion to his whole bloody book. Reference must be made to one or more questions or sets of questions before we conclude. I have said before that the scope of this work is limited and that it is not intended to de deal exhaustively with the entire subject of holism. But within, the, but within the limits of the introductory task which I have set myself here, one problem remains to be mentioned. It is the problem of the whole. The great whole itself is distinguished from the lesser wholes, which we have found as the texture of evolution. In other words, is there a whole, a supreme whole, of which all le le lesser wholes are but parts or organs? And if there is such a whole of wholes, how is it to be conceived? Is it to be conceived on the analogy of an organism as nature? Or is it to be conceived on the analogy of mind and personality as a supreme divine personality? Or are both these conceptions inadmissible? And is there some other way of conceiving the system of wholes in their actual or possible synthesis? These are very difficult and thorny questions, but it is clear that we cannot leave the consideration of wholes at some present stage of our argument. For the argument implies clearly something that something more to complete it, even in the preliminary way in which um, the preliminary way, which is all that is intended in this work. Two points arise from the preceding discussion which naturally carry us forward to the consideration of these larger questions. In the first place, where do we fix the limits of, the le of a lesser whole? In a whole, we have in uh, 
in a hole, we have included its field. But how far does this field extend? What limits are there to the field of an inorganic body, or an organism, or a personality? Leibniz represented each monad as containing or mirroring the whole universe in its own way and from its own particular angle. Lower monads, of course, more imperfectly than higher monads, but each in its own degree a sort of microcosm or miniature universe. In other words, each tiniest least monad is in a sense cosmic and universal. This description would not apply to a field. As we have seen, a field is of the same character as the inner aura of the whole, only more attenuated in its force and influence, and the farther it recedes from that era, area, the greater the attenuation, so that the field, though theoretically indefinite in extent, is in effect quite limited in practical operation. And I know this sounds very abstract, but it, you know, coming, um, it, it kind of gives you a picture of how... Um, um, how really intense this sort of becomes, because he's synthesizing an entire model of the universe where matter and life and human organization all forms one sort of pattern. And he says, so uh, this description would not apply if you're a field. So you can kind of get the texture of it. It's very, very dense and abstract. When we come to consider a group of holes, we see that while the holes may naturally uh, uh, may be naturally exclusive, their fields overlap and penetrate and reinforce one another and thus create an entirely new situation. Thus we speak of the atmosphere of idea, the spirit of a class, or the soul of a people. The social individuals as such remain unaltered, but the social environment or field undergoes a complete change. There is a multiplication of force in the society or group owing to this mutual penetration of the conjoint fields, which creates the appearance and much of the reality of a new organism. Hence we speak of a social or group or national organism. But as a matter of fact, there is no new organism. The society or group is organic without being an organism, holistic without being a whole. The mentality of a crowd, as distinct from the member of the individual composing it, is a good illustration of the changed and reinforced mental field which results from meeting of many individuals and the fusion and heightening of their conjoint fields. And the more psychic they are, the more they are under the influence of strong passions or carried away by some contagious idea, the more overpowering the common field becomes. The force of the group field is generally out of all proportion to the strength of the idea or the passions in the individual units composing the group. So, like, he's talking about the effect of human will as sort of a force in the universe. So this is, this is like very sort of, in its own way, it's quite Nietzschean. So the group field is to say the multiplication of all the individual fields. The subject falls under the study of social psychology and is referred to here only for the purpose of illustration. We have in such cases an organic situation, but not an organism. For groups, families, churches, societies, nations are organic, but not organisms. Taking all the holes in the world and viewing them together in nature, we see a similar interpolation interpenetration and enrichment of the common field. When we speak of nature, we do not mean a collection of unconnected items. We mean holes with their interlocking fields. We mean a creative situation, which is far more than the mere gathering of individuals in their separate fields. The union of fields is the, creator, uh, is the creative. Um, where are we? The union of fields is creative of new and indefi uh, indefinable spiritual atmosphere. The external mecha mechanical situation is transformed into an inward synthetic organic situational atmosphere. This organic nature seems in certain situations to be alive to us, to stir strange unsuspected depths in us, and to make an appeal to our emotional nature which often, uh, bugger, which often lies too deep for words. Thus we came to consider nature as an organ organism. We personify her. We even deify and worship her. But the sober fact is that there is no new whole or organism of nature. There is only nature become organic through the intensification of her total field. In other words, nature is holistic without being a real whole. I mean, that's a really long and wanky way to say that nature is an abstraction that we use to make sense of the, the causal interaction of parts in nature. Nor is it merely we humans with our intense psychic sensitivity who feel this appeal of organic or holistic nature. All organic creatures feel it too. The new science of ecology is simply a recognition of the fact that all organisms feel the force and molding effect of their environment as a whole. There's much more in ecology than merely the striking down of the unit by way of natural selection. 
there's much more subtle and far-reaching influence within the special um, or local fields of nature than is commonly recognized or suspected. Sensitivity to appropriate fields is not confined to humans, but is shared by animals and plants throughout organic nature. There is a second point which emerges from the foregoing chapters and leads up to the issue now under discussion. In chapter 7, we have spoken of a general common trend of evolution, of evolution as not tacking and veering about, but as moving in one general direction and keeping a general course and direction throughout the, uh, throughout the endless ages and of her voyaging. How is this to be explained? Here again is the expedient of personification is often resorted to for the purpose of finding an explanation. It is said that evolution discloses a grand inner purpose, that nature or the universe is purposive or teleological, and that no other category will do justice but the great fact of evolution as we see it. But if there's a purpose, there must be a mind behind that purpose. And thus mind becomes to be personified in nature as the source of the great evolutionary purpose which the world discloses. Cosmic teleology spells a corresponding transcendental personality. Do the facts warrant or necessitate such a tremendous assumption? Would it not rather seem that the whole basis of this reasoning is unsound and false? In all the previous cases of holes, we have nowhere been able to argue from the parts in the whole. Compared to its parts, the whole constituted by them is something quite different, something creatively new, as we have seen. Creative evolution synthesizes from, uh, from the parts a new identity, not only different from them, but quite transcending them. That is the essence of a whole. It is always transcendent to its parts, and its character cannot be inferred from the character of its parts. Now, the above reasoning by which a supramundane mind or um, supramundane mind or personality is reached ignores this fact. Such a personality would be creatively new and unlike the holes which we know and which would uh, constitute their parts. It would be as different, at least, from human personality as this again is from mere organisms. To call such a new transcendental whole by the same name as human personality is to abuse language and violate thought alike. There is universal agreement with the whole, uh, with the well-known argument of Kant that from the facts of nature no inference of God is justified. The belief in the divine being rests and necessarily must rest on quite different grounds. From the fact of evolution, no inference to a transcendental mind is justified, as that would make the whole still of the same character and order as its parts, which would be absurd, as Euclid says. From the facts, uh, neither an organism nor a mind of nature can strictly be inferred, still less a personality constituted by both. Nor is it necess no, necessary to make these far-reaching assumptions. There is indeed a great trend in evolution, but it would be wrong and a misnomer to call that trend a purpose, and worse, to invent a mind which to, uh, to which to refer to that purpose. There is something organic and holistic in nature which shapes her ends and directs her courses. Without forming an organism or mind, the totality of wholes which compose nature develop an organic field which is sufficient to control her creative movement. As a physical field has its lines of force, so the organic field of nature which results from the creative interpretation of all fields of holes composing her has its own structural curves of progress. In human society, we see how the social field or, or atmosphere becomes a system of control, a molding influence to which all, in, uh, all incoming members are subject. The individual in society is born into a vast network of controls, and from birth to death he never escapes its subtle toils. The holistic organic field of nature exercises a similar subtle molding, controlling influence in respect of the general trend of organic advance. That trend is not random or accidental or free to move in all directions. It is controlled. It has the general character of a uniform direction under the influence of the organic or holistic field of nature. And there's more. Behind the evolutionary movement in the holistic field of nature is the inner, uh, the inner shaping, directive activity of holism itself, working through the holes and in variation which creatively rise from them. We have seen in chapter 8 that these variations are not accidental or haphazard, but the controlled regulated expression of the inner holistic development of organisms as holes. There is selection, and thus direction and control, right through the entire forward movement, not only in the origins of variations, but also in the various subsequent stages of their selection, internal and external. This organic holistic control of direction, this inner trend of the evolutionary process, is really all that is meant by the metaphor of purpose or teleology as applied to nature or evolution. To infer more is in effect to make the mistake of spiritual idealism and to apply later human categories to the earlier phases of the evolutionary process. Thus it is when we speak of the nature 
or the, of the universe as a whole or the whole. We merely mean nature or the universe considered as organic or in its organic or holistic aspect. We do not mean that either there is a real whole in the sense defined in this work. We have seen that the creative intensified field of nature containing all physical organic uh, personal wholes in their close interactions and mutual influences is itself an organic and holistic character. That field is the source of the grand ecology of the universe. It is the environment, the society, vital, friendly, educative, creative, of all wholes and all souls. It's not a mere figure of speech or fragment or fragment of the imagination, but a reality with profound influences of its own on all wholes and their distancy. It is the oikos, the home of all the family of the universe, with something profoundly intimate and friendly in its atmosphere. It is this home of wholes and souls, the creating task of holism are carried forward. Without idealizing it unduly, we yet feel that it is a very near and dear to us, and in spite of all antagonisms and troubles, we come in the end to feel that this is a friendly universe. Its deepest tendencies are helpful to what is best in us, and our highest aspirations are but its inspiration. Thus behind our striving towards betterment are now in the last resort the entire weight and momentum and the inmost nature and trend of the universe. I have now reached the end of my argument. The reflections embodied in this work lie far removed from the busy and exciting scenes in which most of my life has been spent, and yet both of them tend towards the same general conclusions. It has been my lot to have passed many of the years of my life amid the conflicts of men, in their wars and in their council chambers. Everywhere I have seen men search and struggle for the good with grim determination and earnestness, and with a sincerity of purpose which added to the poignancy of their fratricidal strife. But we are still far away from the goal which holds and points toward. The great war with its infinite loss and suffering, its toil of untold lives and its infinite um, and its shattering of great states and almost all of civilization. The fearful waste of goodwill and sincere human ideals which followed the close of that vast tragedy has been proof enough for our day and generation that we are yet far off from the attainment of the ideal of a really holistic universe. But everywhere too I have seen that it was at bottom a struggle for the good, a wild striving towards human betterment, that blindly and through binding mists of passions and illusions men are yet sincerely, earnestly groping towards the light, towards the ideal of a better, more secure life for themselves and for their followers. Thus the League of Nations, the chief constructive outcome of the Great War, is but the expression of the deeply felt aspiration towards a more stable, holistic human society. And the faith that has been strengthened in me that what has been called holism is at work even in the conflicts and confusions of man, that in spite of all appearances to the contrary, eventual victory is serenely and securely waiting, and that the immeasurable sacrifices have not been in vain. The groaning and travailing of the universe is never seamless nor restless. Its profound labors mean new creation, slow painful birth of holes, of new and higher holes, and the slow but steady realization of the good which all holes of the universe must in their various grades dimly yearn and strive for. It is the nature of the universe to strive for and slowly, but in ever increasing measure, to attain wholeness, fullness, and blessedness. The real defeat for man, as for other grades of the universe, would be to ease the pain by a cessation of effort, to cease from striving towards the good. The holistic nisus which arises like a living fountain from the very depths of the universe, is the guarantee that failure does not await us, that the ideals of well-being, of truth, beauty, and goodness are firmly grounded in the nature of things, and will not eventually be endangered or lost. Wholeness, healing, holiness, all expressions and ideas springing from the same root in language as in experience lie in the rugged upward path of the universe, and are secure of attainment, in part here and now, and eventually more fully and truly. The rise and self-perfection of wholes in the whole is the slow but unerring process and goal of this holistic universe. And so what he's argued for is that the entire purpose of every gram of matter in the universe is to create the League of Nations and a global government integrating every single form of life. And if that doesn't frighten you, then I don't know what will. But yeah.